The Mwangi Expanse is a mysterious land with a history that reaches further back than much of the rest of Galarian. Arguably the most biodiverse area in all of Galarian, the Mwangi is home to numerous beasts, from the benign to the deadly. Ancient flora and fauna are as numerous as the trees that tower overhead, hiding them from the world's view. Ruins of mysterious and forgotten cultures are almost as frequent as the vast array of current cultures that flow through the Mwangi borders. Despite the absolute richness of the resources within the Mwangi, it has a way of keeping invasive outsiders out. Wonton ambition often prove no match for the beauty and utter cruelty of nature here, or the countless dangerous aspects that lie within. There are enough ancient ruins that even the most greedy of civilized people hesitate, dating back to before the Earthfall. However, the region is far kinder to those who are well prepared and merely curious. The indigenous people who thrive within each of the deepest points of the expanse have an intuitive understanding of their surroundings that surpass even the most experienced of the outsiders. Today, we're going to dive into a general overview of the entire region, with particular detail to the larger locations, and in the next videos, the more prominent races that live within the territory. Never fear, I will be diving deeper into everything located within this book in time, but in their own dedicated videos. The book is massive. This is a disc record request for one of my subscribers, but if you'd like to get your own video prioritized, then join my Discord. You can earn gold coins every day just from hanging out in the chat, which can be used on various rewards, such as video requests like this or video shoutouts. I want to add even more digital rewards, so who knows what rewards may be there next month. The weather of the expanse is as dangerous a threat as the flora and the fauna, and this has caused many of the environmental hazards that pepper the Mwangi expanse. The beaches of Lake Okata are just as likely to trap an unwary adventurer with hidden quicksand as in the depths of the Mwangi jungles. Powerful storms regularly shower the expanse, leading entire swaths of the Mwangi to flood with depressing regularity. Due to the whipping wind overhead, storms can instantly topple massive trees on those walking beneath them without notice. Despite the constant winds, there is a pervasive, stifling heat that is present within the region's jungles. Pounding rain batters the jungle daily, leaving a humidity that can quickly leave the average explorer faint. The rain leads to fertile vegetation that blooms as quickly as it rots wherever explorers tread. Noon is easily the worst time to be out and about in the wilds of the expanse, and those who attempt to travel through it will be easily grounded within the sweltering heat. The environments of the Mwangi expanse are as varied as the multitudes of unique races that live throughout the region. From the cloud-brushing heights of the Barrier Wall Mountains, the mysterious depths of Lake Okota, to the fertile depths of the Mwangi Jungle, the expanse contains an immeasurable number of sights, scenes, and experiences to encounter. There are entire ruined cities that lie littered throughout the expanse, remnants of disaster, tragedy, or simple pride that went unchecked. Within the center of the expanse is the mysterious Lake Okota, which winds its way throughout the entire Mwangi. At the center of this lake sits a large white structure known as the Spire of Destiny. Towering 300 feet straight out of the lake, it is an obvious and commonly used waypoint, but an impenetrable fog prevents any from approaching the tower for close inspection. Some believe the spire was built by the Titans, while others believe the spire is the hilt of the Spear of Gazra, plunged deep into the earth to form the wellspring that formed the rivers that snake throughout the entire expanse. The lake itself has a vast ecosystem of dangerously large animals, the most notable of which is the Fetid God, a massive water orm that lurks within its depths. On the southern shore lies Usaro, the city that is home to the Gorilla King that has harassed adventurers for years. To the north of Lake Okota lies the Barrier Wall. 
The Barrier Wall is an expansive mountain range that separates the Mwangi Expanse from Assyrian to the north. It's rumored that there's a passageway within the mountain range that leads to Artokas Kirin Citadel. For those who don't know, Articus is the creator of the much sought after Sun Orchid Elixir, which restores the drinker to the peak of young adulthood. Articus hasn't been seen in decades, but every year without fail, six vials arrive in one of five Thuvian city-states for sale. In the southern portion of the mountains lies the Tomb of a Thousand Tusks, a labyrinthine crypt built by Cassid Divasod, an Assyria that prowls the maze endlessly. Somewhere within the heart of the maze sits the head of the Imperial Lord, Shea Five Dawns. To the northeast lies the ruins of Ko, nestled within the Ko Rarn Pass. Ko was the first flying city raised by the Shori Empire, and many of its secrets fell to earth with the city and remained locked away within these ruins. Swatted from the sky by the Tarrasque, the ruined city is pockmarked with deep slashes and ruined towers across the small valley. The Uamoto people are the only tribes brave enough and skilled enough to traverse the extensive dangers that live within Ko. At the northernmost tip of the mountain range lies Halden, the headquarters of the Rain Wall. The Rain Wall acts as border patrol that prevents monsters and brigands from the Sodden Lands from wandering northward into Rahadom. The Sodden Land is the space previously held by Lurgan and Yamasa, kingdoms that were destroyed by the formation of the Eye of Abendingo, the perpetual hurricane that can be seen raging off the coast. To the south of the Sodden Lands and west of Lake Okota sits the Turwa Uplands and Turwa Lake. The lake in itself houses multiple fallen cities on its shores, mainly due to the volcanic gas that erupts from its depths every so often. A city of skeletons known as Blood Salt rests upon these shores, along with the Golgani city of Agragesia. Blood Salt is unique due to the presence of dozens of skeletons that have been unearthed so far, not in states of attack or of panic, but simply laying around town as if the entire town had dropped in the middle of an average day, presumably from the first appearance of these volcanic gases. The city also has another name that it's known by, the City of the Dragon Men. It possesses this name due to the murals around town that show people with dragon-like wings soaring and flying through the air. Agragrezia has been deserted since the Earthfall, and as such is largely in disarray. Freshwater monsters lurk within the sunken ruins such as marrows, scrags, and scum. The Turwa Uplands are a rocky mountainous peninsula that juts out into the ocean just south of the Eye of Abendingo. Most of the Turwa uplands consist of low, heavily forested mountains with peaks that jut above the cloud layer. Within its forested depths, you can find the Mbeki dwarves, who typically dwell in the mountains high above the forests. It is rumored that one of the original sky citadels lie here, but its whereabouts are unknown. Below the Turwa uplands lie the Kava lands, a less densely forested region named after the tree-dwelling creatures that reside there. While slightly milder in temperature and much less humid than the nearby jungles, the area is no less beautiful and fertile. The sound of soaring birds and waterfalls make it an idyllic destination. All manners of colorful insects will dart through the trees, chased by plumed birds and brightly colored reptiles. The region has a noticeably lower density of vines and obstructive plants, making the region feel particularly open, although visitors have left the region with a distinct feeling of always being watched. This feeling is due to the Kava. The Kava creatures that the region is named after are a tribe of pygmy ketch, small primates that reside within jungles throughout Galarian.
With short color changing feathers that almost resemble fur, they are fierce pack hunters that seem to appear from nowhere, attack and take down their prey before the prey is even aware that they're there. The Kava lands, despite appearing as one of the more beautiful regions of the Mwangi, are dangerous to navigate due to the Kava species' territorial nature and their aptitude for intimidating coordination during battle. To the southeast lies the Bondu Hills, which connects the Mwangi, Screaming Jungles, and the Kava lands. The dreary slopes within this region serve as desolate tombs for the undead, restless as everything else within this region. Stone ruins dot the hills, bleached bone white by centuries beneath the pitiless, shadeless sunlight. Gray clouds fill the narrow valleys, cloaking the already treacherous rock paths with dense fog, slick with the rains that are common to the area. The rain here, usually the first step in fertile plant life, only creates thick mud which grips and grasps at every traveler's every step. Indeed, outside the constant rain, the hills and vales bear only stone, packed soil, and the occasional empty corn. Wildlife within the hills is sparse at best, and most travelers will have to resort to eating bark and desiccated roots, but like much of the hills, these meals are scarce and unsatisfying. Despite this lack of life, the Bondu Hills are pockmarked with forgotten mining camps that once dug into the fruits of the earth. Veins of precious golds, deposits of precious minerals and stones that open like shimmering petals in the hands of foreigner explorers and natives alike dot the mountainside. Many crafting materials can be located within the hills if you have the presence of mind to navigate carefully. Adventurers have often found that the trails of the hills seem to twist and turn, leading even regular travelers astray with surprising ease. The main attraction of this region outside of the material wealth is the ruined city of Arzikiel, also known as the City of Hungry Spires, named after the upturned and ruined structures that resemble a city of haphazard teeth. Precarious and often collapsing in on themselves, the spires will inevitably be found upright again the next day, albeit in different locations and configurations. Finally, at the southernmost point of what is considered the Mwangi Expanse lies the Screaming Jungles, a region named not after some form of danger, but simply named after the constant screaming of monkeys that gives the area its iconic soundscape. When seen from the Shattered Range or the Bondu Hills, the region appears more as a lake of fluffy clouds due to the fog that rolls down the Bondu Hills into the forest here. In contrast to the tall, healthy green of the rest of the Mwangi, the screaming jungle trees are hooked, dark, and shunted. The region is sloped, rising ever higher as it begins extending into the barrier walls, and the tangles of tough roots and wet leaves make it treacherous to navigate by foot. Despite what appears to be the most inhospitable region of the Mwangi, there's an unnatural amount of wildlife within the screaming jungle. From ground-dwelling mammals that roam the forest floor, primates who live within the canopy, and birds that make their nest in the small amounts of foliage above the fog, the entire region is burdened with wildlife. Within this region, there are several especially deadly predators, including the Barukal leopard, a magical creature that possesses the ability to shift its fur color to match its surroundings. Even the plant life here is deadly, with numerous plants being large enough to trap and even consume large predatory creatures. Many an unwary adventurer has tripped over a root, fallen into a massive pitcher plant, and perished, unable to pierce its leathery skin or scale its slippery walls. Strangely enough, the screaming jungle has even more dangers than the creatures and terrain would show. The very atmosphere of the screaming jungle calls to those who enter it, causing many within the Mwangi Expanse to dream of this place. What's even more peculiar, it calls to those who have never set foot within the screaming jungle, almost like some form of mental compulsion.
Before humanity had even emerged onto Galarian, the Serpent Folk had already built an empire that spanned much of the globe. An Ice Age slowed their expansion, and coupled with conflicts, both from outside and within, led the Serpent Folk to stagnate. Sometime during this era, elves arrived on Galarian from the distant planet Castravel through a massive Aradara, or Elf Gate. At this point, the elves settled within Kionan and began exploring Galarian, creating more Aradara to allow themselves instant travel in the future. In the Age of Legends, elves had made it to the Mwangi and created the nation of Mwalaje. Early human cultures came into conflict with this elven nation multiple times across the centuries and were always turned aside. Though peaceful human settlements had little issue with the Mwalaje elves, these conflicts cemented the reputation as dangerous to much of humanity. The human nation of Aslant also rose during this time and clashed repeatedly with the Serpent Folk, leading them to head into the Darklands and abandon their surface empire. Their last stand took place in Ilmuria, the sanctum of the serpent folk demigod Yudersius. Sabbath, an Aslanti heroine, killed Yudersius in his home after a crusade across the Mwangi. However, Sabbath fell to the serpent god's venom, and she was entombed in a remote outpost named Sabbath Yi in her honor. Surprisingly, the Aslanti made no attempt to hold the lands of the Mwangi, and they returned to Aslant, with Sabbath Yi being the only evidence of their expansion across the region. The Cyclopean civilization of Golgon rose to fill the vacuum left by the Serpent Folk Empire, but this empire, like many more, including Aslant, was wiped away during the Earthfall. If you'd like to hear more about the Earthfall, it'll be in the cue card up top. In the Age of Darkness, in the aftermath of the Earthfall, Dahuk, the god of evil dragons, exploited one of the Aradaruses to enter the material plane in pure form. The clans that would become the Ekujes sacrificed their greatest warriors to imprison Dahuk within the portal network trapped between planes. As the Ekuje argued on how to handle Dahuk, other clans traveled north, eventually rediscovering the White City of Nagisa. Despite the clear elven influence to the city, the elves had long forgotten its origins. However, the city had been corrupted by demonic influences in the years since its creation. The remaining clan disagreed on how to deal with this new evil. Some remained near Nagisa, studying the ruins and attempting to drive out these demons, and became known as the Alage. Others feared becoming corrupted themselves and moved to the shores of Lake Akota, where they lived until the rise of the first Gorilla King, becoming the Kalaje. Resolving themselves to confront evil rather than running, the Kalaje fought against the Gorilla Empire for the next several centuries. The Age of Anguish saw rise to one of the Mwangi Expanse's greatest heroes, Old Mage Jitembe and his 10 magic warriors. I will save much of his exploits for a future video, but his greatest feat was the rediscovery of magic and spellcasting, and the sharing of this knowledge to a world that had largely forgotten arcane magic was even possible. His beliefs were simple, but they went on to spawn one of the greatest schools of magic in all of Galarian. If no one benefits from our knowledge, what was its worth? Striking words. That's the exact creed we function under here in the library. Jatembe taught his 10 apprentices and they followed his example, going on to take their own apprentices and so on until one of these apprentices, known as Jade Feather, realized that with so many different apprentices teaching and passing on such different information, much of their rediscovery was not being preserved. She took this matter to Magic Warrior Elephant and proposed that the apprentices begin meeting up in a specific location to exchange knowledge on a regular basis to promote magical discovery. 
Eventually, the apprentices settled on Ntambu as the designated meeting place. Over time, as more of the apprentices joined in this annual tradition, others from within and without the expanse began migrating to Ntambu, seeking the collective knowledge that was being gathered there. The only rule to this storehouse of knowledge was that the prospective students in this blooming magic school would help the nearby villagers and contribute to the feeding and upkeep of themselves and each other. Moving ahead into the Age of Destiny, one of Jatembe's magic warriors, the Black Heron, united southern Gurundi nomads and a number of Mwangi tribes to fight the spreading cults of Rovagug. Their alliance used their magical prowess to attack from above, in the trees, out of the reach of many of these insane cultists. Eventually, they developed massive flying platforms that were all but immune to conventional attacks, and the cults were quickly defeated with minimal losses. These allied tribes would continue to band together and go on to evolve their flying spells until they created the Shori Empire. Starting with the city of Ko, the Shori began weaving powerful spells together to lift entire cities into the air, where they became a magical, powerful ruling force within the Mwangi. Over the next 2,000 years, the Shori peaked and began its decline, with growing arrogance alienation from the civilizations still on the ground, and a general lack of maintenance. The cities began falling one by one to disease, spell failure, and in one case, an attack from the spawn of Rovagug, the Tursku. Despite 2,000 years of ruling, few true records survive and many consider the empire to be a legend. However, the ruins of Ko that can be found in the Barrier Wall Mountains prove that they were no mere myth. During the Age of Destiny, multiple other great cities also rose to prominence, only to inevitably tear themselves apart in power struggles. For example, a holy city of Phrasma, known as Zatrimba, rose early. Mourners from all over would bring small tokens, such as bones or belongings, to the city to see their beloved to a happy afterlife. Eventually, a trade camp was set up nearby, known as Rastel, which flourished from the crump constant travelers visiting the holy city. In time, Rastel became its own fully-fledged city in partnership with Zatimbra. However, as Rastel grew, faiths outside for Asmund worship flourished as well, and Zatrimba attempted to clamp down on this by restricting trade between Rastel and the other four cities. In time, this trade conflict erupted into full-on war, with Rastel turning toward demonic magic to fend off the self-proclaimed holy warriors wielded by Zatimbra. While Zatimbra relied on the power of its ancestors and Phrasma, Rastel began to call upon demon lords, and they received a response in mass. Demons invaded Zatimbra, sending its entire population to meet their ancestors, and then swept across the forest and savanna. Rastel's irresponsible summoning tore the barriers between plains, leaving rifts that Magambia and the Ekajar struggled for centuries to close. However, other tribes such as the Bekyar lean in toward appeasing the demons instead, and even now remain leaning toward demon worship. To the south, a line of warrior kings and queens founded the city of Mazali, quickly raising a fierce army. However, once they had conquered the surrounding areas, their lust for glory was denied. They twisted their honorable military into teams of gladiators, fueling blood sports that required more and more soldiers, and eventually, children from the outlying areas. They used gold and precious stones as prizes, and food and fabric to attract wealth to their ruling city, which quickly began starving and denying the outskirts of the kingdom of valuable resources. In time, regional governors and religious leaders banded together to overthrow this vicious ruling family. The Council of Monasia, the rebels leading this uprising, ventured deep into the catacombs beneath the city and destroyed all the remains of the royal family, but missed the remains of a young prince who had died decades earlier from illness, a prince by the name of Joaquina. He will be important later.
In the Age of Athronement, a few decades after Aridin's arrival, the demon lord Angazin forced some of his power into the material plane. Above the coast of Lake Akota, he shaved jagged stone into a rough altar and forced his magics into the stonework. It's unknown when or who first touched this new altar of Angazin, but when they did, they were forcibly reincarnated as the Gorilla King. As the Gorilla King, they and their successors built a sorrow into a bloody shrine to this Lord of Destruction. As the king and his Cherukas spread further into the expanse, the nomadic tribes united to confront these brutal torturers, sacrifices, and desecrations of their dead kin. The these tribes transformed Matakali, once a site of marriage negotiations and rituals, into a walled fortress where they trained to hunt these demons. Over the centuries, Matakali's hunters built the nine walls that even now protect the Matanji orcs and the Sodden lands from the demonic cultists. The people of the savannah face their own problems in the form of increasingly powerful Null warlords. The Null matriarch Hungry Bones united the Spinebreaker, Red Fangs, and Stone Shaper tribes together after a decade of canny political maneuvering and led a series of successful raids against Mazali and Elo Kolo Ba, making it as far north as Kibwe. When Hungry Bones fell in battle, her daughter shifted from conquest to coercion as she began extorting tribute in exchange for protection along the Savannah trade routes. Eventually, this Null alliance fell apart, but the Nulls have remained throughout Garund, acting as mercenaries for hire. During this age, Taldor's sixth army for exploration sought to claim the terrier between the Nadali Gap in Nex and the western coast of Gurund. The Gorilla King put a halt to this ambition, mastering the army in Nagisa and seizing the magical siege engine Worldbreaker. During this age, the Aspis Consortium also established a foothold in Blood Cove, a previously temporary port for pirates and marauders. They quickly began exploiting the ruins around the expanse, stealing natural resources and raiding historic culture sites. Several clans, including the Ekage, resisted these incursions, but the Siren Song of Treasure drew more and more unscrupulous adventurers every year. The Dwarves of Cloudspire also saw a steep decline during this time period. High King Nkobi, last of the ruling house of the Mbeki Dwarves, lost his only son to illness. Descending into paranoia, he had the royal doctors executed, followed by the surgeons, then local barbers and medicine women. This sparked the civil war that became known as the War of Split Hearts. The Bloodline King was overthrown and replaced with an electoral monarchy, advised by the Assembly of Speakers and the Assembly of Kings. This did do a lot to strengthen the Mbeki and Cloudspire Dwarves in the long run, but it kept them occupied for much of this era. Cheliac, seeing Taldor crumble from within, sponsored explorers to establish outposts within the Shackles. Eventually, they settled south of the Kava lands, calling this area Sargava in the name of Cheliacs. These new colonists, mostly young nobles who had no chances of inheriting wealth, land, or power back in Avistan, quickly forced the indigenous people of the Expanse into second-class citizenship and ex economic exploitation. Back north in Mazali, the Council of Monasia rediscovered the mummy of Joaquina, decked out in golden jewelry and fine robes. Shortly after this rediscovery, the Monasia received visions that showed Mazali would have a grand resurgence and was destined to regain its former regional dominance. They put Joaquina's mummy on display and called for the surrounding clans to come witness the grandeur of their old rulers. This succeeded in raising the morale of the surrounding people, who had faced centuries of disruption from Sargavan colonists, Shackle pirates, and Blood Cove raiders. They brought with them tributes of gold, salt, gems, and other valuable goods. Mazali would soon become a center for religious pilgrimage, regional trade, and a, as a resistance to invading forces. Enraged by the flaunting of such wealth, Sargavan leaders gathered together 
with the mercenaries and pirates of Blood Cove to plunder Mazali. To everyone's astonishment, Joaquina's mummy sprang to the city's defense, driving the invaders out with a rain of holy fire. Joaquina quickly established himself as the city's ruler, using his inherited claim to the throne, as well as his divine power and authority. The various resistant movements flocked to Joaquina's banter, and the Council of Monasia found themselves sidelined within their own city as Mazali turned from a city of trade to a city hellbent on war. After the death of Aridin during the Age of Lost Omens, the appearance of the Eye of Abendango drowned the countries of Yamasa and Lurgan and changed shipping routes across the coastline, sending even more traders through Blood Cove, swelling their numbers. In Sargava, the current ruler Baron Growlis found himself in the bad position of having backed the losing faction during the Cheliac Civil War. When House Thrun took power, he suddenly was without the backing of the home colony, and he turned to the shackles for support, provided he keep paying regular protecting payments. Seeing the profit that could be had, the Shackle Pirates united beneath the banner of the Hurricane King in 4674 AR. Loosely organized, a pirate council has grown around this Hurricane King, and while he does hold ultimate power, this council does have their word in how the Shackles will operate. There will be a bit of 2E information at the end of this video if you're trying to avoid spoilers for various 1E adventure paths. Thank you for the patience on this video guys, I know it's been a while since I got a video out, but 320 pages is a ton to read, and the holidays have been extremely busy. The next part of this video is written, so it will not take nearly as long to get out, and will cover the religion and races of the wonky. I hope this overview was helpful, I will be doing literally dozens of in-depth videos on the topics from this book, cause it is simply a gold mine of information. The Absalom book just dropped, and it is even longer, so expect just a crazy amount of lore videos to come out in 2022. But what do y'all think of the character model? Do you prefer the 2D, or is the 3D one cooler? Let me know in the comments below, as well as your thoughts on how I, well I summarized over 300 pages of information so far. Got a little bit left to go, but pretty good for 23 pages of a script I've written. <laughs> With all of that said, let's look at the events of the last few years. This is the section of the video you want to avoid if you're not looking for spoilers. Ready? Okay. In 4717 AR, about five years ago at this point in time, Vidric rebels captured Sargava, and with their allies and allies in Sanghor were able to fend off the free captains and secure their independence from Chaliax, forming the new independent state of Vidria. The Gorilla King was also slain by a group of adventurers, and his throne currently lays vacant. During an orc raid of Usaro, the altar of Angazin was also stolen to prevent another Gorilla King from ever rising in his place hopefully bringing an end to the Gorilla King's reign forever. And that's it. There wasn't a whole lot. Didn't want to throw spoilers out there just in case anybody was playing 1E information. Guys, I hope you enjoyed. It really does mean a lot for me to see you guys' comments, especially with how much progress I've made since February of last year when I started this channel. I mean, now look at me. I've got a 3D model. I've got over 2,000 subs. And it's all thanks to y'all, so I just want to say thank you, Merry Christmas, and I hope 2022 is a good year for everybody.